get a little bit closer. Yeah, I need you down until you moved away from the speaker. So I heard the uh, eclipse was coming up. I asked Bill in 26C how I could participate in this AMSA experiment. He said, do you have a 60 kilohertz receiver? No, but I, I know how to make one. So I did. And what I'm going to tell you about today are, are two types of observations. One during the eclipse, which is amplitude data, and another uh, frequency effects that I noticed by participating in one of the AWRL frequency measuring tests. So here was the setup. All of, all of this data is on, on this path. I'm down here in South Texas. WWB is up here. And I'm copying WWB on 5 megahertz, 2.5, and, and, and 10 as well. And then in particular during the eclipse, 60 kilohertz. So this is the, the path of totality here that runs down through here. Well, this path is completely under that path of totality. Um, the distance was like 837 miles, which is only about 270 wavelengths at 60 kilohertz. Down in my neck of the woods, we didn't have a complete eclipse. It was about 70%-ish. Uh, so this was uh, the setup for 60 kilohertz. I, I had a rather large loop, electrostatically shielded loop, two meters on the side. It was resonated, low noise preamp, and then the super heterodyne receiver all made with low noise video op amps. So these recovered the, the demodulated amplitude of WWBB, the peak amplitude, and I also had an ICOM 9000 listening to 5 megahertz WWB. I had an oscilloscope to look at waveforms, a spectrum analyzer to back up the uh, digitized receiver. All these things went to a digitizer and into a laptop. So this is what the receiver output. Uh, this green trace here is a demodulated WWV envelope. There's some lightning static crashes. I had a peak detector, which is this orange line here, an integrating peak detector. It was designed to faithfully represent the peak envelope amplitude of WWVB and not get too upset when lightning happened. This trace is the S meter voltage out of the R9000 receiver at 5 megahertz. And it, of course, fast attack, slow decay. It did have a bump to lightning static crashes. So these were the things that, that I recorded. And I picked a digitizing rate, I think it was 35 milli samples per second. That number was picked to not be synchronous with WWVB. I wanted to capture both the peak amplitude and the minimum so I could see both. And here's kind of what that data looks like. These are day long, 24 hour recordings. Here is the WWVB, the, the red is the up and down, here's the, the minimum amplitude of WWVB, the top is the uh, peak, and then that white trace is the output of the peak detector. And then this is a 5 megahertz WWV, this is nighttime, daytime. And these were taken before and after the eclipse, just so I could get a feel for kind of what things look like. So during the night time, lots of QSB, lots of selective fading, for the daytime, much less amplitude, much smoother frequency response, a few city events happening in there. And of course, WWV simply was stronger during the day. And, uh, I mean, okay, normal, normal daytime and nighttime uh, stuff. Stronger at night, weaker during the day. And this is the eclipse. This is uh, during just the day of the eclipse. This bottom data here is WWVB. It was just coming off at nighttime. Daytime would have been right through here, but this peak was the effect of the eclipse. The, the output of this receiver was linear, linear in volts. So the amplitude increased almost linearly in the peak and then started back down again. Went from 160 to 510 millivolts. About 10 dB. This is the S meter voltage from 10, 5 megahertz WWV. The, the vertical streaking, of course, is normal selective fading, but it also had a 10 dB increase at 5 megahertz. Uh, now, this is S meter, so it's linear in dB, right? It's the log of, of signal strength, and it, uh, it also showed 10 dB. So, for this path from Fort Collins to San Antonio, both 60 kilohertz and 5 megahertz WWB signals went up 10 dB. Question? Yes. Was there any delay in that 
from the uh, maximum of visual on the eclipse? Did not note that data. Okay. Did not note that data. I was really busy because while this was being automatically captured, I took data every 10 minutes off the spectrum analyzer in case my computer program crashed again. <laughs> and I want to make sure I have the data because it'd be a long time for the next eclipse. Well, I'm sorry if you have accurate timestamps on that to be able to back to your. You absolutely can. You absolutely can. Uh, this this started at uh, 1650 Zulu. This peak right here is at 1804 Zulu, and following that, the end is at 1900 Zulu. So yes, you can absolutely back out the times. And I had going to the pain of calibrating the computer clock at WWBD within a second. Um, the day of the eclipse. Yeah, so someone who asked the question could actually figure out the answer. Absolutely. The have. Yeah, these time divisions here are Zulu times across the bottom. This was an example of the data that I plotted uh, by hand using the spectrum analyzer. One thing I noticed that intrigued me was that the delineation between nighttime and daytime wasn't just smooth like 5 megahertz was, but 60 kilohertz, it had these real deep nulls, really deep, that I recognized as two comparable amplitude sine waves as they slew 180 out of phase. So it suggested to me that there's two paths, prominently daytime path and a nighttime path, and during this time, both were there competing and they underwent 180 degree phase change. For example, at, at night, ground wave during the day elevated up. Or perhaps a, a wave speed change. The point is that there were two competing paths that, that showed up and were uh, a very comparable in amplitude. Now, other smaller nulls happened, like there's one here, uh, but they were not equal amplitude. But these two prominent ones happen al almost every day. In fact, they, they happened so much that I started plotting them. This is sunrise, this is sunset, and here is the days that I took data on where these nulls occurred. So they pretty well track sunrise and sunset. A lot more scattered in the morning data than there is in the evening. Things are really violent uh, on sunrise when the sun comes up. In the evening, things sort of recombine on their own time and are much steadier. Notice a lot of turbulence at nighttime amplitude and frequency data. So there's the uh, the data from the eclipse. It it showed up a big uh, a big change. I wanted to do the frequency measuring contest, and to do that, you know, there's a few things you've got to do. Uh, you're looking for a tenth of a part per million. You've got to measure a 40 meter signal, seven megs to half a hertz better or better, you're even going to make it in the running. So first of all, your receiver doesn't have enough significant digits to go out that far, plus it's nowhere near accurate enough. So what you do, typically you tune your receiver, I use an R8600, a kilohertz low, and so you get a feed in sideband mode, and now your carrier comes out one kilohertz audio tone that you feed to an audio spectrum analyzer. So typically this is like one hertz, and you can see millihertz on this type of this one. And then, of course, you still have to get calibrated. You do that with WWV. Then you find out that the apparent frequency of WWV doesn't stay constant, it moves. Now, it doesn't move. It's an atomic standard. So the ionosphere does that. Here's uh, hours long. Just to get, this is an hour over here. This is one hertz over here. So this is a waterfall. Older times at the bottom, new times at the top. So time is going this way. So here's from nighttime propagation, which shows a lot of frequency jitter. In the daytime, which is relatively smooth jitter-wise, this is 5 megahertz WWV. And then night again. So there is this positive swing during dawn of a couple of hertz, and then a more gentle negative swing in the evening. But what caught my attention was that there was not only one swing, but another one, and yet another one, like overtone related. That caught my attention. I'm wondering what the heck could do that. So here's, here's the timing. Now, to get a frequency swing, these are kind of collectively called Doppler. We're talking about two fixed points on the Earth. 
So the only thing that could be moving is something in the ionosphere, because they're not moving. So you could have descending uh, ionization levels. And indeed, as the, as the Earth turns, here's some stations, here's the shadow cast by the Earth. As these stations rotate into sunlight, the path to where the sunlight has hit the ionosphere does change, and it does descend. And descending a decreasing path length does give you positive Doppler shift. So it's attached. And likewise, in the evening, it goes the other way. But I looked at the timing of these, and it's not just, it's not just this. Here's uh, local sunrise at my location, local sunrise at WWV. So it, all this funniness happened when sunrise happened at my QTH. Later, here's WWV, there's this here. For hours, in other words, while that path is in full sun, there's still frequency shifts going on. So it's not just this shadowing effect. It's probably a wave speed effect. Here's, here's evening. And this swing is happening out here when the path is still in full sun. For sure, a changing illumination angle, but in full sun, not the shadowing effect. And so, uh, considered a bunch of possible things. Um, what I think it is, more than likely, is that at dawn, the critical frequency is low enough to enable high angle propagation, near vertical incidence, so the band opens up for multiple modes. In other words, I think this is the, this is the lowest order mode, and then in the morning when these higher angle modes open up, there's a double path. If you have either descending ionization or increasing wave speed, Clearly, the twice length path is going to incur twice the shift as the one before it. A three times path would do three times, and that pretty much matches those one, two, three overtones. Highest overtone was a little bit higher, but if, if you look at a given change in height for a high angle, you get a bigger path length change than your low angle. So that all kind of makes sense. So here. <coughs> Here's what finally made me think that's what it was. This is a critical frequency plot. Critical frequency is the highest frequency that the atmosphere will return at near vertical incidence. So you've got to be, 5 megahertz has to be open for these high angle modes to take place. And so here's another picture of these multiple overtones, one, two, the third one out here at 5 megs. You also get those at 2.5. It's certainly within the critical frequency range. For sunrise and sunset, but not as prominent. But there's a lot more D-layer absorption down to two and a half. Ten megahertz shows none of that, but the critical frequency never made it up to ten megahertz. So the critical frequency data tends to support the premise that those multiple overtones or the opening of high angle multiple hot modes, each one adding a like amount of frequency. I think that is pretty much it. Questions?